Thank you very much, Alangiri Janakash, to play a nice video regarding our BSMU. Now I will request Mr. President of BSMU, uh, Mr. Alangiri Janakash, to welcome remarks. Please, Mr. Alangiri Janakash, we are waiting for you. Ooh. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we are hearing you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Bismillah rahman rahim uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thanks uh, to the moderator, our very dear brother, uh, M.M. Hassan Mahfouz, for moderating uh, today's event. And first of all, I would like to praise to Allah for delivering me uh, this evening, uh, what I spent with all of you in this, uh, though it's virtually, but I believe uh, in our today's session, uh, there are so many participants that already joined. As, as you know, uh, uh, almost, I think 400 participants, they registered from different parts of the world. And Alhamdulillah, so most of them, they already joined. So it's okay, let's see how does this program is going to be you know happen and finish and i believe every everyone who joined this event they will be benefited from this uh, event so this is alun Chaudhary akash uh, president of bangladesh student union malaysia uh, i would like to extend my sincere uh, greetings to all of you for spending your precious time to attend this uh, program i'm delighted to meet all of you uh, all of you virtually in this event so I would like to wholeheartedly thank our honorable speaker for today's event, uh, Dr. Batsha. Uh, he's a uh, current, he's a lecturer of Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, California Polytechnic State University, uh, San Luis, uh, California. Uh, sir, uh, he, uh, I would like to sincerely uh, show my gratitude for accepting BSM Bangladesh Student Union uh, Malaysian uh, I mean, invitation for accepting this, though I know it's uh, in, I think, United States, in US, it's very early morning, but still you join. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, from the committee and from all of the students on behalf of all of the students. Uh, and I think Bangladesh Student Union Malaysia, we already showed all of the video. Uh, there was uh, already briefing, I think you guys, already uh, showed some, I mean, already experienced a few things over there. We try to demonstrate uh, what is Bangladesh, Bangladesh Student Union Malaysia, what, what actually we are doing in this organization, this kind of thing. So I'm not gonna, you know, go all details again, but uh, I would like to take the opportunity to just say something about the Bangladesh Student Union Malaysia. Uh, Bangladesh Student Union Malaysia is the biggest Bangladesh student organization, uh, which is like, uh, representing almost 30,000 Bangladeshi students uh, who study in Malaysia. Uh, Bangladeshi Student Union Malaysia was founded in uh, 2014, uh, which was like founded by our very beloved brother, Dr. Muhyiddin Mahi, uh, brother, uh, our few other brothers too. And, you know, Bangladeshi Student Union Malaysia was uh, actually formulated or, or established to bringing all the Bangladeshis, uh, Bangladeshi students in a single umbrella. And our motto or our slogan is be united and lead the way. And I believe Bangladeshi student in Malaysia is very much successful uh, on this slogan and they're very much successful since its establishment. So, you know, uh, Bangladeshi student in Malaysia today, uh, they, they are like playing a very uh, significant role in, Bangla uh, in Malaysia. Uh, by arranging so many programs, impactful programs, uh, which is like online and offline also. And in online, you guys see, and offline, we have so many programs. We are arranging so many programs in offline too. 
So yeah, Bangladesh Student Union Malaysia, they're trying to, uh, you know, help Bangladeshi students, not only Bangladeshi students, you can see the international students also. This event is not only for Bangladeshi students, it's, it's for international uh, students also. So, because we arranged this kind of event, if, even uh, in our last webinar, that webinar also was in English. So that means our focused, our targeted audience was not only in Bangladesh, but also all, all students or all the, you know, the interested people who really wants to get something from that uh, event. So I think that's the thing of, about Bangladesh Student Union Malaysia. And I would like to sincerely, you know, thanks and show my gratitude to my members, the committee members, those who worked uh, tirelessly to make this event happen. So I just, I just want to, I just want to mention few names, a uh, few names, our Vice President Janatul Firdos Tusti, though uh, she uh, already flight to USA, she's in USA from that place also. She has, I mean, she's supporting us, our very own brother Mahfuz, brother Mahfuz, he did like almost, uh, I mean, almost most of the works done by brother Mahfuz, though he's not in Malaysia actually, he is in Canada, as you know, and today he is doing the moderating part. So brother Mahfuz, thank you very much. And our Secretary General, uh, brother Nasim and our two technical technical team members, uh, brother Mahian. I think you guys already watch a beautiful videos, but the, that beautiful videos was made by our talented uh, media. Um, you know, the media executive is uh, called named brother Mahian, and Mahian is also responsible uh, in technical part of this event also. Our another brother is brother Abu Hanifa. Uh, he's he's also part of this committee uh, committee also so i think uh, and few others uh, actually members too they are they are working they are supporting us uh, brother safi brother mithun uh, brother uh, mustafis uh, they are supporting us to make this event happen i am really happy and i'm really grateful to all of you so i don't want to waste i don't want to waste uh, much of your time Maybe it's time to, uh, you know, listen our honorable speaker, uh, listen something from the honorable speaker. And I think from the, from now, I want to leave. I just uh, I just want to, uh, I mean, I'm requesting Brother Mahfuz to continue. And thank you very much. Once again, salam alaikum. Thank you very much, Mr. President Alangar Akash, for your wonderful or welcome speech. Once again, I would like to remind you all to mute your microphone to avoid technical and unexpected interruption during the session. Your cooperation is highly appreciated. Uh, Brother Mahfuz, just uh, Brother Mahfuz, just one more thing. I just I just want to uh, remind our all participants, please. Uh, in our today's session, uh, Bangladesh Student in Malaysia is like already planning to give you the certificate event, the FATA participant certificate. So don't forget to, you know, put your attendance on the attendance sheet. We will share during the, the I think last uh, end of this session. So make sure like you already fill that form so that we can give you the certificate event. Thank you very much once again for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we will uh, mute it our microphone to avoid any unexpected interruption during our program. Your cooperation is highly appreciated. If you have any questions regarding our webinar, you can type your questions in the chat box. In the end, there will be an open discussion section and question answer section. For your kind information, we will take a group photo at the end of the session. Please prepare yourself for that at the end of the talk. Before I proceed, Proceed, let me give you a brief introduction of guest speaker, Dr. Batsha. Dr. Batsha did his Bachelor in Science in Civil Engineering from the International University of Business, Agriculture and Technology, IOBAT, in 2010. After his graduation, he served at IOBAT as a faculty member for a few years before starting his MSc at UNESCO the Netherlands. After that, he came back to IOBAT and was promoted to senior lecturer. After serving another two years at IOBAT, he was awarded a PhD scholarship at, Hong, at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. 
Upon PhD degree completion, Dr. Bacha was invited to the State University of New Year as a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Environmental Resources and Engineering. Currently, Dr. Bacha is working in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo, California, as a full time lecturer. Now I will welcome Dr. Bacha to deliver his important speech. Actually, we are waiting for you, sir, for your important speech. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mahfuz. Uh, let me share my page presentation first. Is that okay? Yes, we can see your presentation, sir. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. Salaamu Alaikum. Though it's very early morning here, maybe my voice, you can feel it that I just woke up a uh, few minutes back. Okay, welcome. Welcome all of you to the presentation. Today's presentation topic is information session on higher education. Basically, I'll be talking about the scholarship opportunities or how you can apply or how to manage fund in a world uh, ranked top universities. I think that would be the mostly your interest to know about this process. So I'll try to cover based on my experience when I received multiple scholarship throughout my educational journey. So as I, um, you already know about me, so I won't take much time introducing myself because um, the moderator already introduced, give my brief intro. To I'm not so I have a couple of slides, just quickly overview um, about my educational the background. So as you see here, I did my bachelor's in civil engineering uh, from IUBT, International University of Business, Agriculture and Technology in 2010. And then I got a scholarship from UNESCO IEG, the Institute for Water Education from the Netherlands, where I did my master's degree in 2015. And then I came back to IBT and taught another uh, two years. And then I get PhD scholarship at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So, what I did during my PhD study, basically, I was trying to develop a smart, innovative nanoscale or nano adsorbent material to remove heavy metals from wastewater. So, uh, based on that, I, I was able to produce an innovative pH independent adsorbent material, which is magnetically separable. Uh, which you can see in my slide. Based, up, based on this uh, innovation, I got very top um, publications uh, from international, uh, very renowned journals in the field of my specialization, which is environmental engineering and science. Then during my postdoc, basically I worked to validate a technology which is born in the lab of uh, Professor Dr. Tao at the State University of New York. Uh, that university actually hired me to run a pilot scale project at um, San Luis Obispo, a small city in between Los Angeles and San Francisco in the USA. So during my postdoc last year, actually I run this pilot setup to recover ammonia from wastewater sludge. Uh, as the ammonium sulfate fertilizer. So this was the final product out of the wastewater sludge. We are able to produce this ammonium sulfate. It was a, a great success and based upon, uh, based on which actually our project won a award from California Association of Sanitation Agency for the 2022, we got it under the title of Excellence in Innovation and Resiliency. Yeah, and all totally, I was um, involved in teaching from the beginning of my career. So I spent um, almost five years teaching at IBT uh, from where I graduated in Bangladesh. 
And then after the postdoc, while I was working here in California, I have been invited or hired as a full-time lecturer at the California Polytechnic State University. So some of you might know about this university. This is uh, one of the very top university, undergrad university in the West, that is in California. So among 27 undergrad uh, universities, teaching universities, uh, this is always kind of top choice for the students. It becomes a number one or two in the California based. So you might be confused at this stage because California has a um, few more very top universities like Caltech, uh, then you can say about the Stanford. Actually, there are two categories in the USA universities. One is um, that is called Research University, R1, and another one is the Undergrad University. So my one is the Undergrad University. Basically, we give up to MSc degree and we are not highly focused on research. Uh, but we are very good at like teaching. So that's why we are categorized as a teaching university, one of the best in the West. Okay, so if you want to know about my interest in research, then I would like to conclude in these two lines that my specialty is in industrial water and wastewater treatment and municipal solid waste management. Currently, I am heavily engaged in teaching the relevant courses under these two topics at California uh, Polytechnic State Universities. So, from here, I would like to draw your attention to focus on my presentation because um, for what actually you joined this session, right? So, at first, I'm showing one of the um, global map to show you the, uh, the, the linkage between the developed nations and their education level. So what you see here, definitely the North American countries, the Western Europe, European countries, and then Australia. These are the major areas on the global map, which covers 100% of the education. So this literature rate has a direct or indirect link to our, um, in my presentation, especially the higher education. But I, will, I will show you within a couple of minutes. So some technical issue. Okay. So here you no, see, but... if you see, you just have seen the global map on the education status. Now you see the, who are the donors of the international scholarships and who are the recipients. So it is clearly visualized that on those black uh, spots or black dots on this map, definitely the developed nation or developed countries for example, North America, they are the actually donors. They, are, they provide fund or money to the countries. Those are underdeveloping and especially they actually hire the student from those countries. Why? Because they have, they own the world finest research institutions. They all technological innovation taking place there and there, uh, when they run that kind of research facilities, then definitely they need a huge amount of human power, human resources. And that's why that uh, opportunity is created. Like they hire so the eligible student to keep up or uh, running their international or uh, the latest research works. So, the relationship between these universities or those professors and the aspiring students, I often give a funny example that is like a marriage. If as a bridegroom, if you wanna marry a girl, then you have a set of expectation that you want to go for a beautiful girl, 
she might be having kind of a uh, education at certain levels, say honors or master degree. Maybe you have a kind of choice of height, maybe some like the family background or even the skin color, how, how beautiful she is. So you have a set of attributes to before you decide to marry someone. Similarly, the other part that girls might have a set of expectation that who would be the his bride, so bridegroom. So when both aspects from both sides, when expectations are made, then only the marriage is possible, right? The same thing happened here. If some aspiring student looking for the best universities for admission, at the same time, the universities or the professors is looking for the best students who will be best fit under his research work. So when the both sides expectation met, I mean, a professor is looking for the best student at the same time, the student looking for the best university. When this expectation met from both sides, then only the recruitment of a student at a world-class finest university can take place. Yeah, so now I wanna show you where is the most student actually um, choose uh, for their higher education, which region in the global map. So definitely the first choice or the dream of any student who is uh, like thinking about his uh, higher study then definitely is in North America. That is that would be the first choice. Then the second, the second one is definitely the Europe. Then the other option, the Australia, and then maybe they choose later on for the other countries, maybe the Asian countries. So why, particularly not American um, universities are kind of at the top at their uh, least from the student side. I found there are a couple of reasons for that. For example, in North America, you will find a diversified and very kind of open the environment and the latest uh, like the scientific innovation is taking place and they have uh, set up and continuously improving or introducing the new and very brand new courses, uh, which can meet the challenge of this 21st century. And then obviously the North American universities and their curricula, they're uh, like, they have a very unique uh, like education system. And above all, the cutting edge technology that are uh, relevant to that, all the research works is taking place here. I want to give you one example on this. For example, the MSc program starting in 2021. What I'm showing here is a program uh, from the UNESCO IHG where I did my master degree uh, from Netherlands. So in the developed countries, what happens, you will not find very traditional uh, kind of uh, the degree program. Like if you are from uh, Southeast or uh, South Asian countries, you are from South Asian countries, then you see we have very much kind of typical traditional degree program. Okay, the Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering, maybe the Tripoli, e, then Computer Science, and few more. These are the core basic engineering subject or the department you can choose from the list. But what happens actually for higher education and especially in the top ranked institutes, you'll see their program is very dynamic. They change every year. They introduce very new subject area that in the interest of the global need. For example, you can see I'm talking about just a certain part of civil engineering that is environmental engineering under that major department. We have only a uh, section relevant to water supply and uh, wastewater engineering, under which you can uh, relate here. These are the full master degree uh, kind of uh, department 
you can see here these five departments introduced, which is covering the topic of environmental engineering, especially water and wastewater treatment. And then they have a subdivision. I'm going to talk about it that I'll just talk about the water science and engineering under that program. They have introduced this new, uh, very new master program. If you read this topic, then you'll understand how a kind of specific, how focused they have developed their program. So you can be a specialized uh, in your interested field in very narrow area. So this is how actually everything is split up. This is the same in the USA. When I teach my undergrad student, I can see how like nicely their course curricula is designed. They have a international uh, partners and they have industry partners. So every year they sit for a, uh, a long kind of uh, discussion and meeting. And from there, they listen to the industry. They listen to the all other stakeholders and they continuously uh, modify their curricula and they teach to the student which is really relevant and they can instantly utilize that knowledge which they will learn from the classroom and they can implement to the industry. You know, the 20% of the undergrad from my university, the California Polytechnic State University, around 20% of the total recruitment in the Apple, the company who produce iPhones, they hire 20% of their interns from my university. They feel, because you know, California, the Silicon Valley, the head office of all giant techno, technical, uh, like those giant company, like Facebook, uh, Tesla, Microsoft, Apple, every, every the big companies, they're born here and their, their head office is sitting here in Silicon Valley. It's just a few hours drive from my campus. So this student actually, mm, they, they are very kind of highly trained during the undergrad and so much uh, they learn uh, relevant to their practical life in their respective department. So they have a very high impression. So I say around 20% of the interns hired uh, from my university in Apple and most of them, they got offer for the job once they complete their uh, undergrad study. So the same thing happens to my department. They have a very prestigious kind of uh, uh, highly recommended the industry and the government offices. They hire the undergrad student who graduated from my university. So the reason is that uh, the class material, if I would have a chance to teach you from my class, then I could only tell you what is the difference from the other part of the world, how they teach is really, really kind of applied part. They not they are not interested to teach you research stuff. I mean the I'm talking about the undergrad. So they they are, they take or minimize the theoretical parts and they introduce more and more practical stuff. So in each course, I took my student for two three field visits. So what I teach, what I cover in my class, actually they can really enjoy and see the the application of the same technology in real life. So this is how students get motivated and their uh, like when motivation level of a student go high, then definitely you don't need to put that much effort to teach them because they learn automatically because of their interest. They see something real, so they uh, really get uh, motivated and then they uh, like focus on stuff uh, to see that the relevancy in their practical life. So then from here, I would like to talk about the uh, challenge in searching global opportunities. So I identified these following things. So first of all, I find there is a lack of information, but it is not that the, the lack of information on waves or internet is not. It is, I'm talking about the lack of information to students. Because many students, they, uh, they show a kind of a strong interest for higher education. They often find opportunities. For example, uh, people uh, attending this uh, session, or maybe 
the other students or your friends, everyone like who is studying, they, they have a kind of set of mind that one day they will go abroad and get a, a scholarship and continue their study. So, but um, most of them are limited to that interest only, but they hardly explore and invest time further to know more details on that. So everyone actually wants to find a shortcuts. That is uh, from my life experience I see and how student approach me and write the text in Facebook or email. I can tell you, I receive a dozen of them every day, but mostly kind of a, um, the question they ask is kind of a stupid question. It's like, I'll, I'll discuss some of them as a, an example. So there is no focus, there is no kind of a um, certain like ambition, but they just ask for it. So, but there is no vision. There has, they have no kind of a concrete plan uh, from that. If you ask me a question, I'll be able to understand you. I'll, I'll be able to read your kind of how much time you spend on that topic. So that kind of ability, I just, I, I earn over time. So, uh, so that is the point I'm saying, the lack of information to the students. Then lack of motivation. Some students, they have interest, but they are intermediate. They, they are kind of afraid of uh, like accessing more information and to be serious on this. So they feel that maybe I'm not fit for that. I need too much on that. I need to prepare myself. I'm not eligible for that. Maybe my CGP is not that high. Maybe I should not try. Or maybe my language skill I need to develop. And at current stage, I'm not in a position. So that kind of a lack of motivation, they do not have faith in themselves. That's the another issue or challenge. And then the other type of stuff I would like to take here is education consultant. In every country, you'll find a number of education consultants. I should say, 80% of them kind of be involved in kind of, uh, um, it's not actually truly they're working uh, to help the student. Rather, most of them actually having a business set of mind. So instead of helping student in the right direction, they show something very ambitious and then they take the money and then they earn money, but actually, uh, they do not actually give the right information or they do not uh, help them to find the best places for them. Instead, what they do, sometimes I saw, uh, they have a collaboration with a kind of a low-ranked universities in different countries. For example, maybe Malaysia, maybe China, for other countries, they have a, a collaboration. So they actually have a kind of contract between the university and those consultants. So they motivate students and some students without realizing, they think that, okay, outside country means something international. So they immediately start dreaming and because they find it shortcut because they don't need to spend that much time on that. They just go and some university even receive without IELTS. So they actually feel this kind of a, shortcut way to go abroad so they spend money on them and this so-called educational consultant and then they take money from them and they send those low quality university some of them after going there they come back within a year some of them they stay there maybe illegally start working by leaving the university they start earn money so so this this is kind of the, uh, the this is the story uh, I, what I know from the most of the cases from my neighbors from my friends from my students some people share their bad experience on that so based on that I'm sharing this so basically you don't need any third party in between you are truly interested absolutely you don't need anybody in between the university admission from the beginning of the process, everything available online from the university website. The only the thing is uh, you need endurance, you need perseverance, actually have to 
continuously put effort on that. From my life, for the first scholarship I uh, received from the UNESCO IG, I had to spend almost two years. I invested two years. Just remember, before me, from my university in Bangladesh, again, I'm repeating, before me, no one had this, uh, like, no one in front of me had these opportunities who earned the scholarship from my university. So I had no reference even to discuss. For example, today, today you are uh, listening to my talk. Actually, you have a resource, right? You can uh, learn something from this session. But from me, I had absolutely had no one to help me, to, to guide me. So I started from the scratch and I spent two years and then I was able to get an uh, kind of a, a scholarship from abroad. So if you uh, think uh, like you are serious, then you just spend time from today's uh, session, what you learn is to start following that. You receive the copy of this presentation slide. I provided a PDF copy. So it has a numerous links, different kind of important information. You can explore them later on. And if you start the process, then definitely you can uh, actually, you can manage a scholarship if you're eligible and if you are uh, like kind of determined on that. So how you can do that, I'll show that process and I'll discuss. So now you come back to the topic or today's contents of my presentation. So many students, they do not realize what is the difference between scholarship, research grant, fellowship, research assistantship, TAship. So I'll just go introduce this uh, individual subtopic to you so that you have at least a clear idea what are those. And then what you should apply, when to apply, or whom to contact how to write an academic, an academic CV or curricular or uh, vita, and then how to write an email to a professor, how to write SOP, statement of purpose. That is the SOP stands for. These days I receive a multiple emails, a couple of emails every day. Now I can see from your student perspective, when I used to send email to my to different professors. Now I receive emails from different students. So now I can clearly see when I delete the email instantly and when I become serious about a student just reading from their emails. And then I seriously spend time to read their CVs and then maybe I'm positive to recruit the student. So what attracts me towards the students? So that kind of experience I'll share with you with a um, real example. Then how to check university ranking, even some students, if some education consultants try to bluff you, cheat you, then at least you can check by yourself the ranking of the university in the globally and on the national scale, then at least you will have some ideas uh, about that university before choosing that uh, for your future career or for your higher study. Before investing money, you should be really, really careful. If you get something very easily, someone saying, okay, come, uh, I can uh, arrange an admission to this and that university. You should not think positive on that. Uh, rather, you should be kind of suspicious. Why is so much easy? Why uh, they are hiring me uh, like uh, such an e easiest way without asking some kind of requirements? So you should, must have this kind of question. Then you automatically understand their intention and you will be able to see what's the wrong with that. And if you check the university ranking, that will also give you a, or tell you a story on this. Then how to find professor's directory. Sometimes students say, how do I get an email from a, for, of a professor that I'm interested in? So that is quite interesting. I'll give you kind of an idea on that. How to get contact of a professor? The same question, actually. So let us let us go um, slowly and cover this individual topic for your better understanding. So first of all, scholarship. So in a simplest way, if I want to say, every 
government, every universities, they have a set of scholarship. Every year, a certain uh, kind of a, uh, like a, like the university session, maybe sometimes it's fall, sometimes spring, depending on the university context, it depends. They prioritize the highest amount of intake. Usually I consider from the US context, it is fall. In the fall semester, actually the university hired the highest amount of student uh, compared to other <clears throat> uh, session, academic session of the year. So where they have a certain uh, like a number of scholarship under different name, sometimes <clears throat> government finance, sometimes it could be even offered or provided from an industry. So they provide a full scholarship. That means they will pay your tuition fees. Uh, that means they will pay your living expenses, everything. So these are the scholarship usually is given to the top ranked or very bright students, those who is capable of showing their merit and they, they are easily distinguishable uh, from the other students with the highest kind of uh, highly skilled or capable of a certain task or in a, in a certain kind of a uh, topic. So based on that, actually they offer this opportunity. So it's quite competitive compared to the other kind of funds. So, and usually the money they provide a scholarship comparatively is really, really high. I can give you one example from my Hong Kong life, uh, PhD life. They have a Hong Kong fellowship, PhD fellowship. That money comes from the government and they pay um, this kind of 2,000, <clears throat> more than 2,000 almost 2,500 US dollar per month. This uh, pay the scholarship to the student only for living expenses. And that if you receive that fellowship, you get almost, <clears throat> um, you can say uh, at a time when you get that scholarship, the first semester they pay additional $4,000 for your expenses. So it's a huge amount of money if you think about it, just a single student. Whereas they give another kind of fellowship that is called studentship, uh, a postgraduate studentship. I was under that. So in that case, they pay me kind of 1,500 US dollar. So it's a huge difference between that even pay. But for the achieving that, getting that scholarship is not easy. Um, you have a kind of number of steps, the screening process, actually very bright students actually qualify for that. So based on my profile after MSc, I was not qualifying for that. That's why I, I had the chance to go for the PGS rather than scholarship. So in terms of other facilities, like when you go to international conference, uh, the PhD, the scholarship guys, those students receive um, more coverage, like they get money for traveling for the, the conference, attending conference, they get uh, the, the, the uh, coverage for their hotels. So they actually get full funded uh, for any conference, international conference. Whereas my case, my case, I was just uh, given the money which I need to travel, not the other cost covered from my scholarship. So there was a limit for how much you can spend on that. So what I say, the scholarship is always attractive, or always the something that you expect. Uh, however, for that, you need to have a certain qualities. You need to have certain kind of educational achievement or extraordinary kind of thing you have to have in your profile to, to get a scholarship or to compete on that. So under this, actually, you do not have any obligation. Usually, most of the scholarship, you are not uh, obligated to help or to uh, work under any professor for their research staff. So you are almost kind of uh, uh, independent. No one asks you for a specific task rather than your research. So you don't have to work for them. The scholarship usually is given to you just only to focus your study. So you are not obliged to help any 
uh, TA job, RA job to your professor. But for other kind of um, uh, ship, fellowship, or if you have the RA ship, uh, TA ship, especially in the US contest, then you must work for certain hours every, every quarters or semester. <clears throat> then that I'll talk about uh, later on the slide. So sometimes uh, every professor, they receive the research grant. Uh, they submit proposals for their upcoming research. And this is also a competitive process. And based on which they are awarded, the professors are awarded by a research grant. Sometimes it can be like NSF, National Science Foundation, or state-owned agency. They provide funds. Sometimes industry like Apple, Google, or maybe other kind of uh, top the companies, they might provide the grant. So that money comes for an, under a professor and then that professor having kind of uh, the enjoy the privilege to spend that money to accomplish his research job based on his proposal. So when he want to complete the research work or any research grant I get, for example, at Cal Poly, I have to spend Indeed, I cannot spend it as I like. There are certain uh, like guidelines for the research grant. So based on which, uh, one thing is that I can hire a number of research students. It may be undergraduate, postgraduate, depending on the depth of my research and the type of thing I want to achieve. So once it's like a, you are opening a company, a consulting firm, so definitely you cannot work alone. You need a accountants, you need a, uh, someone kind of a lab assistant, you need a couple of engineers, maybe electrical, civil like that. So uh, similarly, a research project uh, demands a couple of uh, like the expert minds or kind of uh, some student, those who have a research skill. So this is how actually this is happens. Like, Professors pay their students as a uh, like a living expenses as a kind of a salary or a student bursary, and then that money used to live. At the same time, the students spend for their living. At the same time, uh, they are obliged to help that professor to conduct the research, and at the end, actually, uh, they accomplish the the project research goal. At the same time, this student also make publication out of those results. And this is how also they are awarded by the degree. So I believe now you understand what is a research grant. Usually it might be government money or maybe <clears throat> provided by a top kind of notched company. And that money can, may come from the industry uh, to do a research on a certain topic and a very specific to the topic and then uh, professor might uh, circulate a kind of a um, <clears throat> like the advertisement to recruit students uh, uh, giving some kind of requirement. It's okay, I'm looking for a, this undergrad student who should have a, a completed degree, bachelor's degree on this topic or this subject area and he must have a, this, this A, B, C, D, this kind of a list of requirements. So based on that actually he circulate the uh, recruitment uh, kind of stuff and then all over the world student apply for that position and then professor pick up few of them or shortlist them for an interview and then through this process actually the whole process or the <clears throat> recruitment kind of process go through the professor so professor is the person who can decide uh, which student he's going to pick so <clears throat> that's why it is important like where you should start uh, like the process in this uh, uh, finding the opportunities and abroad for higher study. So I recommend like most of the cases you should start with the writing professors or if you see any circular on internet in LinkedIn or any other sources from where you can get the detail and if you qualify for that you should write to them showing your interest and sharing your kind of achievement whatever you have in your profile. Then <clears throat> the other thing is research and teaching assistantship. Every quarter, like this quarter, I have three courses. I need three TA. 
I'll recruit three teaching assistants. But it is not that international student. I will basically hire a student from the, the California Polytechnic State University. This student actually will be paid based on their hourly work. So they will grade my assignments. I will have a solution for assignment. So this senior student already completed that same course. This student will be working with me as a grader. So we call them grader. Basically, they are teaching assistants. So they will be paid by the department hourly basis. So similarly, if I have a research project, I might hire um, some couple of students to help me laboratory analysis because as a professor, I cannot work in the lab, right? Uh, every professor, they have a kind of a setup. They have a uh, combination of UG and PG students. Actually, they work for them. So, but every time the student report to us, in a weekly or monthly meeting based on our feedback, they modify or revise if necessary and they are uh, like lab analysis or laboratory setup. So in this case, what I'm talking about the teaching assistantship that those are mostly uh, hired locally from the university so that they are paid hourly and they help us organizing class, grading assignment or any other class activity I assign to them. The other kind of RA and TA available in the, each university, basically uh, they are more in depth, like you have to work for that professor for a um, particular hours. Um, there is an agreement between student and professor. And if I have a dedicated research project, then I might need a, a PG level student, I mean postgraduate. And that time I might hire students internationally and then I can circulate that uh, needs from the university website, from my personal website, or maybe some other third-party platform like LinkedIn or any, any other media uh, professional network I can circulate. And based on that, actually, those aspiring students look for that and they start writing emails to us. And from their emails, we find the best candidate, um, like after shortlisting and after a physical interview. Okay, so next is the question come, what to apply? This is very in general and common question my student asked me, uh, especially from Bangladesh students ask me, sir, which country I should plan for or why I should apply? Actually, though, this is a, not a very good question because as a, um, like, first of all, I'm busy here. So I have no time to spend on your profile and I have no reason to spend time for you. I have no ready-made answer, answer for that because just remember, uh, just imagine you are writing me and asking the same question. How can I tell? I don't know your research, your research background. I do not know your undergrad research project. I do not know about your results. I do not know your language skill. I never taught you in my class. So how do I know which university will be best for you? It is you who has to explore that question. Okay, I am X, Y, Z. I have A, B, C, this kind of qualification. So as I said, it's kind of a match, kind of a marriage. Your expectation and the university or professor expectation must made to be a successful marriage. So similarly, you must uh, set your target university and department based in your profile. So as an ordinary person, you cannot suddenly think about a internationally top models uh, to think about that you will marry her, right? If you are really having the similar kind of quality, you are internationally known personality, then only you might think about maybe, okay, you can give a marriage proposal to a top model, right? A ordinary people cannot reach, right? And he, he should not dream, then the whole time will be wasted. The same thing applies here. If you, uh, your profile is weak, your CGP is not good, your uh, language skill is not good, in all aspects, you are not that good. So you cannot suddenly expect that you will apply for Oxford, Cambridge, right? then definitely you should have a limit. You should set your limit based on your profile. So I am not in a position to judge your capabilities and your profile 
and I have no time for that. So you should not ask this kind of question. So this is the question you have to explore by investing time. You sit in front of your PC, spend some hour every day to explore your interest and which university globally is best for that topic. And then you prepare yourself in a way that you uh, specifically meet all the requirements to get that scholarship. So you have to plan from the beginning of your study. And as you become senior student at the university level, you should uh, gradually improve in all aspect and you should be ready. You should do those uh, testing like ILTS, TOEFL, or maybe GRE based on where you are applying. The other question is, this question is also relevant. Is your, is your kind of plan just to get a degree and come back to home or you want to get settled there? Some countries is good if you have a plan to get a degree and then get settled there, then definitely USA, Canada, these are the, I think, the top choice because these countries are having a huge amount of kind of uh, opportunities. Once you finish, usually you can stay there under a certain kind of work authorization. You can stay up to three years. Even if you do a master degree, you can stay up to three years uh, with a kind of work authorization. I mean, you can work for the company before you get the green card. So that's why people choose these countries. First of all, they can get a worldly uh, recognized degree. And then, then after degree, they find immediate uh, like the option to start work. And some other countries, uh, like especially the Asian countries, may not be that attractive. In including Malaysia, I heard uh, some professor, I had talk with them, like student can go for uh, kind of a study there, but to find a job opportunities after education is not easy, like the um, North American countries or maybe the European countries. So they have to come back usually. It's very competitive because the national policy in Malaysia or country like that they have the highest priority for their local graduates compared to the international graduates. So they, the government's policy actually limit this, uh, maybe the industry and others to uh, recruit so many international students. So they are welcome to, for the study, but it's not that common and it is not that easy you get a job there. So usually people plan for uh, moving from there later on. So same thing I'm, uh, I would like to say, so if you have a plan that you will get a degree and you want to settle there, then I should say the, you should have a choice or you should have a uh, like target that you should find opportunities in a North American countries, US, Canada would be the best. So why to apply depends on certain things. As I covered it on the study, study and citizenship, value of the degree, Definitely, if you choose North American, there should not be any question about your degree. No one can judge you or tell you that, uh, like underestimate you based on your degree. It happens sometimes if you have uh, like degrees, sometimes uh, in some countries like country like Bangladesh, um, usually if you have a North American degree and someone having a degree from a good university, but Asian universities, for example, Japan or even Hong Kong, they have a very, Singapore, they have very top institution uh, for a PhD program. But still, if there are two competent, uh, competence or two candidates for a university level job, if you go to Bangladesh, then definitely they will choose the university authority will give priority to the North American degree. Because the university can sell also, sell their employee, like they can say our staff our faculty members having North American degrees. So I saw some of the advertisement even university uh, job opportunities in Bangladesh, the top private universities. They often mention even that the uh, PhD from North American countries will be, uh, is expected or will be uh, like uh, given more priority for this recruitment. So 
they openly even say in their recruitment advertisement this kind of stuff so globally there is no issue on the quality and the on the degree if you get it from a north american university uh, then qualification of the applicant it depends on the university to university as you go top rank university you must have a better profile to achieve so and the financial abilities of the uh, participant this one applies for those who is ready to take admission under partial funding or under partial funding or maybe self finance some student may be rich they don't bother about the scholarship they may even they are ready to invest money so in that case it depends on your ability financial ability like how much you can spend on that or sometime you get a partial funding from a top university so you think that you should not miss it and you should not wait for the another full funded opportunities then you can go in that case maybe 80% 90% tuition fees are waived so you can pay extra 20% by your own and then you can get world top or prestigious university degree when to apply this is also kind of common question student ask usually these are very easy you just search the university and easily you'll find the in admission uh, like uh, in if you if you just search and uh, go and visit their website you can easily extract that deadline uh, when you should apply for a certain scholarship how many months before usually the the international standard or the common thing is at least you should plan 4 months ahead of the starting day of your uh, uh, study if you plan the fall semester you want to start in september uh usually starts in september then you should plan for 5 months before you should submit the application because the university authority also need certain amount of time to screen the huge number of applicants and to find the best out of it so i should say 5 to 6 months before you should submit application but always check the university website and their instruction it is not universal universally the uh, true for every universities they might have a different kind of uh, opening and the kind of deadline so you should check in the university website it should be very clearly stated so you can get it so in general these are the calendar the fall usually end of august or beginning of september this is the uh, like it starts this i mean the semester starts so you have to plan for scholarship at least 5 months before or 6 months before you have to submit application so accordingly you should plan when you go for uh, the ilts uh, gre and all other exam so you should plan accordingly and you see uh, from my mind i see the the maximum input in the university in the usa is um, they target in fall so you should target fall semester because they offer highest amount number of scholarship that time compared to other semester but it's not always true so you better check with the university website and then you'll find the detailed information <clears throat> where they pick our the recruit students the maximum number in which semester so the next question is how to apply so this is also a kind of relevant question here but as a uh, like a digital era in at this age you should you should have uh, idea uh, at this stage you should not have kind of this kind of question because every university or portal or website if you go in under admission graduate admission then you will have this kind of link online application link then it is very much kind of well guided a kind of a steps so once you create a kind of a account there it will allow you to guide you through the process and step by step uploading couple of documents and through which you will be kind of self directed to complete the application and most of the cases you might need to pay application fees uh, through the credit card or from some banking system because most of the us university they ask for the application fees so after paying the application fees you will, your application will be uh, will just uh, be considered uh for a certain intake 
if you apply for a certain scholarship, then it will go through the screening process and then you'll be notified on certain time by email or if you uh, create account, then you can also visit that account time to time to see the status of your application. Sometime you can also get these opportunities through the embassy. Every country is, for example, in Bangladesh, in our, um, if I visit Japanese embassy in Bangladesh, if I visit US embassy in Bangladesh, so they have a certain amount of scholarship. They each year they offer on and publish that the process and how to apply and what qualification you need. So everything you can get from their website. So if you live in Malaysia, so you try to uh, search those um, like the embassy websites and definitely you'll find, uh, if you see the Japanese embassy website, you'll find the Monoboshi scholarship or that they call Maxed scholarships. So every year they are recruited um, based on the, the collaboration between your country to the other country. They have a uh, fixed or sometimes a certain number of scholarships available every year. So you can apply through that embassy too. So you just uh, grab those information from the website and then you should be able to understand the everything throughout the process. And you will have a contact email and contact phone number so you can easily reach them to know the detailed process. Then if you go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it happens to Bangladeshi students. I, I don't know for the other countries. So our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, under that website, we also uh, see a couple of advertisements, those scholarships available for Bangladeshi students. So from there, this could be a wonderful source. You can visit this link. So you see these underlined text, each of them having kind of a hyperlink. You see, when I move my cursor, it shows the hand tool. That means it embedded with a link. So when you receive a PDF copy of this presentation, you can just click on the link. For each of them, you can uh, get an idea. Uh, by visiting those websites. I'm not going to open it now, that, then it will be really long. Then home to contact first. As I said, if you are not a, that kind of top uh, student, meritorious student, like you, if you do not have that exceptionally high CGPA, if you do not have that exceptionally high GRE TOEFL course, uh, the, the scores, and then I suggest you go through the university professors. The reason is those uh, open scholarship needs or demands very high kind of merits and high profile student they look for. But for a mediocre student, I, I believe you should start writing to a professor by email or if you see any advertisement that a professor recruiting some research student, that would be the first step. Then once you are able to convince a professor by showing your profile that you are eligible for that position, then professor will guide you for the rest of the process, how you should apply um, and which way you should proceed. Everything professor will guide you or connect you to the admission department. So this could be the beginning of the process for most of you. That's why <clears throat> uh, I have a nice example here. So how to write an email to a potential um, like MSc, PhD supervisor or professor? So that is a really relevant and very, very important question here. So you must pay attention here because this would be the, the heart of my today's presentation. Because if you learn how to write a good emails to a professor, then your 50, 60% things are done. Because once you are able to convince a professor, once he respond to your email, that means you can continue talking with him. He might have an interview with you and then gradually you might be selected. Once you are selected, a professor choose you for his student. It's like a, for his lab, it's like a, a company owner or a boss is recruiting a kind of employee. So professor can decide whether he will pick you or your friend or somebody else. So he enjoyed the ultimate power or the, the position uh, or that kind of 
decision maker whom he is going to pick up so i just give you example this kind of email i recently received from a student and do you see the red lines at the end this is an instant delete email that means if you send me this email or to any professor then from the subject line from the structure of the email will not even read your email i'll not respond to your email i just delete that email or put it in a junk box immediately now you might be wondering why is it so first of all professors are busy here and they do not have that much time to respond 10 20 students every day they are very much selective and this kind of emails is like a very plain email from this email i have no clue who are you how you are qualified how you are relevant to my project do you see any any clue here is very it's written kind of a very in general way i will also tell you one trick if you have a one email copied and copy and paste and send a 10 20 30 professors this is also clearly identifiable we can read the email and you understand that you did not write that email for me you have a type a email you copy it and paste it to different professor we have that kind of ability to read from your email and we can identify how much time you spent on us so that's why we do not spend time on you i'll show you the next another set simple email you will get this slide with you so it will be shared with you so don't worry if you cannot finish reading this email i'll just highlight a couple of points here here i am showing my i'm telling my name and immediately i'm saying that what is my background i mean what is my a uh, kind of bachelor's degree specialized and at what university what department and what major subject i belongs to you see a single line already giving me an impression that this guy okay someone is civil engineering student but his major is environmental engineering then he is studying maybe from the name of the university i might recognize if it is that kind of globally known top ranked university then definitely i will understand by the name and if i cannot immediately recognize that university because globally there are hundred and thousand of universities there so what i can do i can quickly go to google uh, and then i can quickly see the national rank at least national rank one of the professor in my life who said uh usually when he received email from student he always check the national ranking because you cannot always expect the only student will be applying from the top ranked university those of uh you you know by name sometimes a one university in malaysia i may not know about it but i can quickly search and see the rank national rank of the university so basically that professor try to recruit student from the top ranked university nationally at least nationally for example in bangladesh we have buet bangladesh university of engineering and technology shortly we call buet so that university is globally known 100000 graduates they are uh, working outside of the country they um, studied outside with a scholarship and then get settled in the usa every state everywhere if you go you'll find some buetians i mean student from buet so many us university know bangladesh university means buet they may not know my university they may not know other universities so similarly when they see this university rank is nationally top ranked university at least 1 to 5 then they always already have a good impression that this student may be the best student of the country definitely because if you are uh, you are from a number one institution from your country level then definitely you are the best student of your country right 
So that makes uh, sense and that become easy for a professor to get an idea that what kind of students you are. So at least he starts believing you. Okay, this is a good student. I maybe he is a good uh, student and I can, um, like he can uh, be interested to read your email couple of more lines. So you see, in the first line, you can attract a professor. You can attract or capture the attention of professor if you can write the right words in a first line. Other than that, I won't read the whole email. Then you lose the opportunities, right? So be specific. Don't use even a single word writing in your email. Mm, that may not be necessary. And no emotional words, no other things, and no requests, no other unprofessionally. If you approach, that will be also funny and they definitely will be laughing at you. So then you give your status, like what usually undergrad student, they start sending email at their bachelor's, uh, maybe the after third year or beginning of the fourth year, or maybe one semester before they can start writing email. In that case, you can say simply that I'll be graduating and that time, then professor might have a plan. Okay, I will have a project in January. And this student is going to finish his undergrad at that time. That would be a good timing for us. He can plan and he can be interested in you. Or you might, you might be already a graduate. So that is another story. You can write, I completed my bachelor's at that year. Then immediately you should write your, you should highlight your attributes. Like you have to sell yourself to the professor. So how you sell it? If you want to sell a product, what you will say? Definitely you will say the good qualities to the customer. So now you have to sell yourself to a professor. So you can say, I have this CGPA. Then definitely if you say 3.85 out of four, definitely it reflects that you are a serious student. Then comes other things like you secured or you get overall band score of IELTS or maybe a GRE or any other test if you take already, then you should highlight that within the first paragraph. So you see, it's just a two lines, but I know about this student from a different corner of the world. I know nothing about him, but I did not open his CV, but he summarized his achievement within one two lines in the first paragraph. This is good enough to attract a professor who will be interested to read second paragraph. Now I'm telling him that I have interest to join you. And then what you want to do, now you have to write in details. Like you are focusing at adsorptive removal of heavy metal ions. And in one of your class, you or maybe in a conference, you read about that topic and maybe some professor taught you and then you have a chance to read one of his article relevant to the topic. And this is how you came to know about him. And then you may be uh, interested to uh, work on that. And if you read his latest paper on that topic, every scientific research article usually ends up with kind of future prospects or the, the opportunities of, or what are the, um, the lackings in that research field, what somebody else can carry on to keep going on the same topic, to explore more on that topic. So based on that, you should spend time, you should read a couple of papers, and then only you can write, you can propose something, but be careful here. If you write something very shaky with a shallow depth, then that professor is expert on that field. So he will be able to judge you. So before you write something, you must spend time, take time and really spend time and then you write something. So if you write something is really kind of provoking interest of your professor, then definitely, you already almost convinced him to respond to your email. 
So if you can write the second paragraph appropriately, I think you should study that professor and his type of works. You should spend at least one week time. Because to write this second paragraph, though it looks like three, four lines, but without spending one week time on a professor's profile and his work to get familiar with that topic and read some other latest findings on that topic, you need a week. Trust me, you need a week. You cannot copy paste and send email to every professor. It, it will not fit for sure. So that's why individually you have to be selective. And when you write a, this paragraph, from this paragraph, I will understand what is that thing the student talking about how about his depth of the knowledge on the topic and did he really spend time on my profile did he really read my papers it will be easily reflected by this single paragraph once i am convinced then i'll be interested on other things maybe i can open your cv then then you can write the other things the third paragraph is not that essential but you can add to impress him more because once you convince him by the second paragraph, the third paragraph is kind of he is willing to read. And this is kind of uh, convincing him more in a kind of um, saying some good words, paying time that you are really serious on professor's time. You just read there what I wrote. Like, I hope you don't mind getting in touch, but I would like to inquire whether you are currently accepting graduate student. Now I'm just asking him whether he is in a position that he is recruiting students, he has a fund, and then if you are, you would, uh, then would you willing to take uh, talk to me a bit more by email or phone? You give him, you are giving him multiple options, or in person if I can arrange a campus visit. So this will be applied for the case if you are living in the same country, you know. Sometimes a student from California can write me an email, right? He may be living just another cities. From that perspective, I wrote it. He can say, I can physically come and visit you. But it is definitely not if you live in Malaysia, you cannot come and visit me. So that one time after a seminar, I shared this slide and one of my students sent email to a professor. And then he, he make a draft and he shared with me that, Sir, is this okay? Then I find this line there. Uh, then I, I understood the student did not realize it. I said, you are in Bangladesh, then how do you say that I can arrange a campus visit? Is it possible that you will be coming from Bangladesh, you will be given a visa to visit a campus? It's absolutely not. So please try to understand sometime the email. You should not even copy my email exactly and to send a professor. It should be it should be in your version right based on your situation okay so then you emphasize you are saying that it seems like an excellent fit for me because of it emphasize on exactly on the topic i mean you are showing why that department and that particular university is good fit for you you are trying to say more and then you say i still have a few specific question about my research topic that I would like to talk to you about. That means you are not only showing some interest, at the same time you have some question. So having question is a good thing, but you must have a relevant question, not some a kind of um, some stupid question definitely you should not ask. So, so this kind of email is really, really, you can say excellent email. And this format, you should keep it in your collection. And then you modify it based on your profile, based on your target professor, target university, based on your situation. But overall format should be like this. I'm sure if you send these 10 emails by spending enough time on a certain people or professor, out of 10, I would say you get eight reply back. You know, in the first two years time, First one year I sent hundred and I think several hundred emails. I um I I just got a reply from a couple of 
uh, them from from few professors. Maybe I send 200 emails, I get two reply, or maybe not even one single reply back from a professor because that time I know nothing about sending email. So I just write email like this kind of email. So these are instant delete email. So professor, I copied email and send everyone. I do not spend time on them and they do not spend time on me. It's simple. So when I started writing this email then, during my PhD life, almost everyone replied me. And at one time I get a scholarship on that. So you can say it's a tested, tested email. This is a proven email that it works. So you can believe in it. You can try because you cannot suddenly write this email, right? To write this kind of email, you need to sit for the IELTS exam. Maybe you have to sit for GRE exam. Then you have to spend one week time to a topic or to a professor to study him thoroughly. And then you'll be able to write this kind of email. So it is not like, copy paste rather it's a, to write this email you need time i hope you understand that so why this email is good i have explained this all the points already and you get this hard copy of this pdf copy of this slide so you can spend time to learn more i am not going to read from here then other things comes like writing academic cv is also important because when professors is happy to see your email, the next thing he will open your CV. You may share your CV in your first email. Sometimes people do not recommend to share a resume in the first email because if he doesn't reply you based on your email, then why you should send CV? He may not even open it. So better you keep just sending email first. If you get a re reply, then definitely if you are able to convince him by email, then definitely he will be asking you, could you please share your CV or resume? Then you just send him that. So what would be the standard format of a CV, academic resume? So in this link, you can download my CV and also it, it covers the following subtopic on the CV. So you should not prepare CV in general like a job application. You better format it in this way so it is a, become an academic resume. Based on that, professor can easily find uh, this information which is uh, kind of relevant to him. I understand you may not have all the points on your CV. You may not have a publication, right? Number three, you may not have a publication. So what do you do there? Sometimes um, you can skip them if you do not have a publication, but definitely you should have kind of a relevance uh, kind of experience or participation like in a conference you participated. Uh, maybe you have uh, taught in some classes, UG classes to help your professor as a TA in undergrad, or you might have a research experience with your professor, but no paper published yet. So you can add whatever you have based on your profile. So as many of this topic can be covered, you can try. If some are not fulfilled, accomplished yet, you leave them. You just uh, delete that part from your CV. So how to write the state statement of purpose? I mean, so why you are going to select a certain department, why you are going to study in a certain de uh, department and what is your ultimate goal. So this perfectly covers here in this topic. So you must show your interest and motivation for a, a certain position. Then you have to highlight what you have, what is unique compared to other applicants to uh, select that topic and why professor will pick you up. So you have to very clever way, wisely highlight yourself to uh, like show him your salient features, your attractive features. Then why do you think what you are the uh, why you are the best candidate? So that you have to highlight. How will the position help you to reach your desired goal? So that is also important. Like you have to 
not only tell the best candidate at the same time you have to say if you are given that opportunity so what will be your kind of desired goal how do you accomplish your desired goal because you have a set of mind right you want to achieve this because of that so you have to tell that story at the end what would be the impact globally or institute level or your country when you will be coming back that is also kind of interest uh, important question that you have to uh, cover in your sop then you should uh, read the requirements of that offered position very carefully based on that you should write this so you should touch each of the point how the requirements of that position fulfilled by your qualities by your attributes that would be the highlighting point i will provide you a link at the end of this slide if you visit my personal website then a couple of sop the draft copy a sample copy is there which is written by me so during my um, phd when i send proposal or write sop to a professor i have those uh, standard formatted documents so you might access them to see as a kind of example version to produce your own one okay then we go for okay how to check university ranking as i said sometimes some education consultant might show you okay i'll bring you to that university i'll give you arrange a scholarship for you blah 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 so you should not trust on them if you want to go through a though it is not necessary but if you want to go through a consultant you better check the university ranking national ranking or international ranking to understand at least whether it is worth going to study or invest money to get a degree from that university or not so again i am saying these are the word and with hyperlinked uh, uh, like text so you can easily click and that website link will be open in a browser then you can check i'm not going to open them here because it will take kill some important time it's already getting late i i spend one hour 20 minutes so i try to wrap up as soon as possible then i will go to answer some of your question so how to find professors directory this is also very easy question you just go to the university website under departmental website you can easily find professors there with their specialty their research interest based on based on that you can choose them for yourself so who provides funds and here are the detailed information in a broader way i can say the government scholarship scheme every government has a scholarship scheme university or in individual professor might have a fund they can offer funding industries companies they have a certain amount of money uh, ready to spend on this kind of a different kind of education purpose so they offer this for their product development like the giant company they have they pay a lot of money to the top universities to uh, do research to improve their product quality the international donors adb bank world bank they have their scholarship programs especially for the developing countries then rotary foundation bill and melinda gates foundation spend a lot of money for scholarship in europe that the especially germany has a dart scholarship erasmus mundus commonwealth scholarship ug Uh, sorry united nation organization you can explore some of the scholarship so each of these hyperlink test you can click and it will uh, direct you to a uh, page in a browser and from that you can learn more details so i'm not going to open and tell you now for this individual yeah so now what things to prepare before you apply for admission usually if you target north american then definitely you should uh prepare yourself for gre test that is called graduate record exam and tofl exam and for the other countries ilts would requirement i'm just giving you a little, little bit idea about the score of gre basically the 
this test is designed to test your analytical and language skill. So that's why it's split up into two parts, verbal English and the quantity that is math. So I'm just giving you an idea, for example, 170 for each section, that is the maximum score a student can achieve. But the, there is a minimum score also. If you attend the exam, then you are already given 130. So that means anybody attending this exam, you will get a minimum 260, even if you do not perform well. And then the, how much you can score, that depends on the how much you can do with the remaining score, like 40 in the both uh, section. And based on that, I'm just giving you one simple example, like if someone lose 20 points here, then if he gets 60 out of this 80 score, what you, it is available there to score, and then it will add up 320. And then the I'm giving you an idea that what is a good score or fair score or an excellent score. So since it's a total score is 340, so anybody having score 320 plus, Jerry is a really excellent course score, but it's not easy, it's really tough. It's only few students may get in the whole country or it's time of the exam. And good score, if you can have 310 plus, then in most of the US university you can get admission. And here is the link. You can visit this link and watch a video in YouTube which explain more about the theory exam, how you should plan. And there are numerous training coaching center. If you think or if you even buy a GRE book, then you will get the detailed idea on this exam type. So I should not spend more time on this topic. Then if you think about TOEFL or IELTS exam, then this is the more or kind of explanation of the exam type and there's I split up the individual section of the exam. So you just read it from the slide. Uh, then I'm just trying to give you idea what is the like good score, IELTS or TOEFL score. You can just think about the requirement at Harvard University, the TOEFL requirement is 110 plus and equivalent to IELTS score is eight. So you know that IELTS score measured in the scale of uh, up to nine and to get eight is really, really high. It's not easy. So that's why the top university like Harvard University, their requirement, if you wanna apply for the admission, you must have eight. And depending on the other qualities, your profile, you might be given a scholarship or you might not. But for the admission requirement, you have to have that much. So you can easily understand why I said, when your profile is not that high, you should not choose the top university, right? That should be always a match between your qualification and the, the university level. That should match. Otherwise, you'll waste your time spending few years but you know outcome will be coming out yeah so i think this will be the question some of the question will be common in your question i know based on my experience in the qa session when you will be asking question i'm sure 80 percent of them will match this kind of question that's why i will not go and answer now uh, rather i will ask um like audience uh, the moderator uh, like what kind of question he can maybe sum up few of them to a single question and then i might answer so it's already i'm talking almost one hour and 30 minutes so i won't take much time here is the end i think as a beginner you have a quite good amount of information to start the process with but i would like to emphasize one more thing to you if you see, there is a, a link at the end of my personal website. So I'll just ask you to visit my website. I have a dedicated web page for the study abroad because many a time I get questions from students. I have no time to answer them. That's why I created this platform so students can visit and get the answer. So I'll show you after clicking this link when it open up a page, I'll just share that one. 
so that you get idea how you should access my web page. So if you click that link, you'll get this personal website. I have many things, so you don't need to spend other uh, time on other things. You just go to education and hobby in this page. And if you go to the my lecture, if you go to study abroad, additional supports here, uh, despite my undergrad courses, you will find here a number of resources, including the presentation, what I cover it today. Even the moderator do not share the, or forget to share the PDF version. You will still be able to access my slide. The same slide I presented now, it is available online. You can download. And then you have academic resume sample. You have a statement of purpose sample. You have research proposal sample. All that thing you need. Even I have some video, previous uh, presentation, and also some text written as a blog post on my Facebook wall regarding higher study and even taking up the job in a multinational company. So different kind of stuff I have organized here. So at least I can easily pass this link to the student and they can spend time and they can get the answer, their answers. So I don't need to repeat every time. So I hope you enjoyed this session and now let's uh, give the um, this uh, control to the moderator. And if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you very much, sir. It's very nice and informative lecture. We get some information. It's very helpful and important for us. So now is the question section and the open section. So if you have any questions, you can put the, your question in our chat box or you can unmute your microphone. You can ask the questions. Thank you all participants. Uh, good morning to sir. Assalamu alaikum. May I ask a question? Sure, you can yes. ask the question. Okay, this is uh, Osman Harun. I'm now speaking from Bangladesh. Uh, I'm a PhD researcher in University of Malaysia. Uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, nice, informative and very effective uh, delivery. I'm really impressed, and I have learned so many. Um, have learned so many new things, especially about the emailing, and also how to convince the professor. What I'd like to know, actually, uh, for the countries like if I apply from the social science, and actually my background is from English and communication. So far we know the scholarships are provided to the science background and uh, all the technical issues. But for the social science, uh, I'd like to know whether the scholarships are available in the Asian countries. Do you please assist me in this regard? Thanks again. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Um, since I'm also from a technical background, like engineering student, so I do not have a direct experience on that, but from my talk or from my experience when I talk to other colleagues, the scholarships are definitely, there are numerous uh, scholarships are available for social science people because they're ongoing research work. Uh, but the issue is that number of scholarship compared to the engineering or technical education uh, is not that many. So from your perspective, the competition would be high. And definitely if you search your subject area uh, globally and your targeted country or the universities, definitely you will have the opportunities. That is for sure. But the only thing is that your competition level may be much higher than the engineering student because your type of research, if it is not that attractive topic in which you are studying, then maybe the funding opportunity is limited. So professors, if they do not have money, then they, they cannot recruit students, right? So it's always depending on the how attractive that or the ongoing research, how uh, kind of um, interesting the topic is, whether the uh, professors and in that area, they're able to get enough funding from government or any external sources. So based on which actually the availability of that scholarship depends. So I would say, you just keep searching 
and if you are determined enough and if you qualify uh, like as i said uh, in terms of your your requirement what kind of score or either uh, I, I don't think it's a gre for the general student i think you are different kind of the test um, the arts student at undergraduate level i know for the business student they need a sat test sat sat test so i don't know exactly maybe you should know that there might be other uh, kind of testing system which uh, if you score a very exceptionally high and your un the undergrad or master's level if you have a, a good record of publication or good cgpa so all aspect if you qualify for that though the limited scholarship opportunity is there but still you should be able to manage one if you are determined and if you keep searching for it thank you thank you very much sir so we have an another question is jerry is the requirement for the post graduation studies in usa sometimes some university they waive the jerry yeah, that is true. Uh, even for Cal Poly in my university here, uh, they have no strict requirement. Usually we do not recruit students for PhD level. We have only master program and they mostly self-finance. So research is not our primary focus. The university is more kind of designed all kind of applied parts of the student. We teach them in a way like hands-on so that they immediately go and serve the, the countries, the top companies or industry or the government organization. So each of the topic, each of the thing we cover is very much related to their real life. We a very kind of um, limited topic we cover from the theoretical aspect. And that's why there is a one problem in uh, the Cal Poly, though in the West, in California, this is a top number one or two undergrad universities, but these graduates are very good attractive to the industry. They easily hire them. Even they offer them every week, the industry people, there is a session. They come and they spend uh, two, three hours and uh, give a session and they recruit students from campus. Every week, the people come here in the kind of a job fair. The problem is our students have a problem when they go for some of them, you know, few of them may be interested in the PhD study. So then when they go for the top universities like Caltech or Stanford or whatever, then or R1 research university, those are the dedicated for the highly research university in the USA. Those university underestimate or they actually, uh, they do not, uh, actually give that much credit to our students because they know you guys are very much focused on the uh, real life applied part. But you know, for PhD research, they are more interested on the, uh, the theory or the research part. That's why the objective of this university's goal or the study curricula is not that good at to serve that purpose, kind of helping the research. That's why our students sometimes is not very good option to hire for those research universities, but they are really excellent for the job markets. So this is how actually the difference comes. And that's why even the GRE requirement is not that, uh, that compulsory here. Even the other one, the university in New York, I was working as a postdoc. I saw one student from Sri Lanka, he joined there without GRE. Then they say during COVID, even many university waived the GRE requirement because of the scheduling, many students having problems, could not handle. So USA University waived GRE during COVID and, and they introduced a new scheme, like professor will set up interviews and professor will prepare some questionnaire questions uh, and send to the student and the professor will be assessing the student quality in terms of language, because if he set up 30 minutes interview with you, definitely professor will uh, can justify your English ability, right? Language ability, like how, how much you can understand, you can talk or not. And then second thing, he can give you a simple test over kind of online. He can send a question 
you have to answer within one hour and send it back. So it can be a topic very in general from your undergrad. So this is how he judge your analytical skill or mathematically quantitatively how much you are good at. So that student was not given any GRE, but he uh, is given a question from that professor after interview. So this is how he came and many other students, many other university having this kind of alternative options. And especially during COVID, many university actually was relaxed in terms of GRE requirement. Yeah, that is true. Even still now, you can still find some universities. Yeah, you don't need GRE. Thank you very much, sir. So I have another question. So this question is that is very interesting question. Uh, one student he is interested to do a master's under your supervision. Is there any opportunity from your side? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, basically, here I got a one-year contract uh, as a teaching full-time teaching uh, lecturer position. And you know, in the USA, to get a full-time tenure track assistant professor is very highly competitive because around the world, all top applicant who is looking for a position in the academia, they are applying for this, right? So uh, I have also applied under the same department for a tenure track assistant professor position. I already faced first round of interview waiting for the result. They have a four more steps. I have to go through physical interview, then I have to give two presentation, one on teaching, another one in on research. So this is how actually that position will be filled. I'm a kind of, I have a greater chance to get that position because I'm already teaching here. Department knows me personally. This semester I get very good feedback from my teaching student course evaluation feedback. So based on that, I have a little bit positive side. I might get it, but it is not sure. There are highly competitive, there are candidates, um, competing for this position. If I get that full permanent position, tenure track assistant professor position, then only I'll have this uh, funding and I can have internal funding. I can apply for the uh, government external funding with collaboration with some colleagues. Then I might have my own lab and might have, I need a, once I have a lab, I need a one, uh, one setup. I mean, a group of students who can assist me. I can recruit students. So it will take time at the end of this year that decision will be made. Or maybe I might get a position in another university in the USA based on my experience one year here because Cal Poly teaching experience is highly uh, like respected from other universities. So based on this achievement, I might have a position somewhere else. I don't know. So if I have that full-time assistant professor position, that time definitely I need some students and I'll hire maybe from some Asian countries, maybe <laughs> Malaysia, Bangladesh, India, um, Pakistan like that. So I wish uh, I, I'll be able to recruit some of them at the end of the this year, but currently no, I'm fully responsible for teaching only. So I'm just delivering classes. I'm not involved or I do not own any lab. So I do not need any student at, at this moment. All right, sir. So dear all participants, uh, once I remind you, there is attendance from in our uh, text box. Please fill up the attendance from for your certificate. We will provide a e-certificate in your email. Please write it down in your correct email. Sometimes I find people have, didn't write down their correct email address. So, sir, there is another question. What is the duration of a PhD program in USA if a student already has a master's program? Do all universities in USA require coursework? Uh, from my, as far as I know, uh, the duration is definitely is uh, kind of uh, in standard is uh, four years, but sometimes I saw uh, it taking more than that, like five, six uh, usually in the U.S. perspective, uh, the research are kind of in-depth, so professors have available funding, so they don't bother to keep funding students. So as long as you are paid um, in your position, so you, you should also don't bother. And sometimes in Asian countries, professors stress a lot 
but USA is mostly free and independent environment. So you can have enough personal time. You can enjoy the, all the vacations, the leaves, so no one will bother you. But for Asian country, like I did my PhD from Hong Kong, I saw professor um, give a lot of pressure and they sometimes shout at students. So this is not the culture in the USA ground. So usually your supervisor will be like a friend and he will not bother your personal time. That's why sometimes some students go slowly. They are not crazy that you have to make publication on a certain date. They don't uh, need to meet certain deadline, though it depends on professor to professor. But in general, the pressure is not as you feel pressure in Asian countries from your professor. So based on that, Sometimes time is flexible and professor happily provide funds for more years if you need to extend. So in that case, actually, it goes five years, six years. But in standard case, four years. In some cases, it happens that some student outstandingly perform and even they finish three years. So the degree actually requirement depends university to university, professor to professor. Some professor has a set of publication kind of criteria like you have to publish three top journals like my professor in Hong Kong she has a standard you have to publish two papers and third one maybe will be under review under that stage you have to you can go for defense so un unless you satisfy that requirement she will not allow you to go for defense so it's a really kind of flexible university may not have very strict regulation on that it mostly rely or depends on your professor your supervisor is all in all to decide when you are going to graduate so he will decide actually so there is no in general way to say this many years or this many publications or this and that thank you very much sir and there is another question how they claim the study gap or how they write the study gap purposes because in the COVID situation many students they lose their study gap. So how they get this opportunity in the SOP or to getting an offer letter from university? I think the best way would be definitely the main reason he, she can highlight and everyone is aware about this. So that should not be an issue. The other than that, you should not say like you are totally sitting home. You should uh, show the, though you are not able to productively utilize the time, but still you were involved like on desk work, like you did some review work, maybe you are involved in a review papers, uh, working on that, maybe some, some of them are under review or you are preparing, or maybe you had a chance to uh, work kind of freelancing or related to your field. You might had a chance to work online um, just in the area of your expertise that actually just try to show the time you use during this time productively as much as possible from your side based on the circumstance that you have gone through. Thank you uh, very much. Dear participant, do you have any questions? Yes, yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, can I ask a question to sure. our honorable uh, teacher? Sure, sure. Uh, I, yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. This is Saad from UTM Malaysia. So I would like to ask a question. I am not entirely sure whether I missed out on that part of your discussion, but in case I missed out or I am not clear about it, if you would uh, briefly clarify it to me. I have one basic question, actually. One thing I, 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 I'm, not, I I'm trying to get is, Let's say I want to find a funding in computer science stream, okay? Let's say I want to find a funding in computer science area. And in the website, there are so many professors in the faculty website, computer faculty, computer science faculty website, there are so many professors. What is the best way to know or what is the effective way or the good way to know that this professor has the funding besides reference from LinkedIn? Is there any good and effective way to know that uh, this so-and-so professor or have funding or is there any uh, like, um, a, I mean, a good resource to know? Like in Malaysia, uh, we have websites and they uh, pro provide posters like 
fund, uh, call for GRA, call for masters, these things we have here in Malaysia. But for US, uh, is there any advertisement kind of thing or is there any good and effective way to know uh, besides LinkedIn that this way could be a good and a good way to find the professor whom to email? Uh, am I uh, am I able to make my uh, uh, question uh, convey to you, sir? That's yeah, my yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, clear. Yeah, thank you, sir. That's my question. So for me, actually, in a civil or environmental engineering student, what I did, even for my postdoc, I how did I manage? There is a, a every department, uh, like you have a professional association of the professors. Like for me, it's called AEESP, Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors. So this platform, actually, all the environmental engineering professors, they have this professional kind of platform. In that website, usually they post the recruitment PhD or postdoc or any other student. Similarly, I believe you have to search, search from your seniors, brother, that or in Google search you might find under the topic, even in computer science may have a multiple subsection, subtopic under that you might have a small group. So those people, if they have a professional uh, platform, that would be the best way um, they might post periodically that kind of job opportunities or student recruitment. Second thing, uh, LinkedIn research gate, they often post that uh, like that kind of uh, position available and some professor i saw in hong kong and also usa in there uh, if you link those professors uh, i know you will get many of them but still uh, sometimes their short profile are visible under their name so if you can trace that he is in the area of your interest so yeah you have to spend time on that so if you spend time then you will be able to find out of 50 professor maybe 10 or 15 of them are uh, relevant to your topic and then if you open their personal um, like biography or the field and then in google scholar you can quickly search or in their website sometime at the end of their page in the research uh, or research interest they often mention that i'm recruiting uh, there are some position available sometime professor always post it under their website if not, you can visit his Google Scholar profile under his name, and then you'll be able to see his type of research and how he is actively involved in research. And then based on that, you'll get an idea, guess, how many citations and how many publications per year he's making. If he is making like a, a good amount of publication, that means definitely he is having a strong research group because either without getting enough data, he cannot make publication. He, if he publish more, that means he has more people who is working under him. So this is how we can get idea. Second thing is, um, if you see his uh, academic awards or research profile in his uh, in, in a website, if you go and search his profile, you'll find also every year how many uh, research project he received the grants he received so if you see that recently in 2022 he received a couple of or few grants that will also give you idea this guy is having a money currently last year he got this fund and then you can expect that he might need some people in the coming year and by sorting them uh, from the initial list if you target four or five the most potential supervisor for you. And then you can send them the email as I explained in my, um, during my presentation, that formatted email, that the best format or excellent email, the structure I shared with you, you just take that as an example and then you fill it up based on your uh, profile. And then you study that particular professor for one week for his publication, for his type of work, how your profile is relevant to that work, or how you are interested, why you are interested, just try to sell yourself to him. I hope if you are a good match and if he has a, a funding available, then definitely he will reply you back immediately and to start the process of 
uh, recruiting your, you in a couple of emails. Thank you. Mr. Hassan Mahfouz, yes. moderator. Yes, sir, please. Yeah. Uh, this is Kazi here from University of Malaya, uh, Malaysia. Dr. Hasnath Bashir, thank you very much for your very insightful presentation. And uh, interestingly, uh, one slide was uh, caught my eyes like the way you showed the sample of uh, convincing the professors when we write our email to the professors or any students, especially students usually struggle to write email to the professors, how to convince them. And the sample you showed really, you know, will be helpful for the aspired students. Uh, so I like to thank for that. And uh, uh, definitely there are more other information uh, helpful for students. But I'm wondering, my question will be relevant to this session because this session is absolutely for higher uh, education, uh, higher education aspired students. But my question is regarding the undergraduate student and undergraduate admission. And as you are teaching there you know, in the faculty of engineering or so in your areas and you are teaching undergraduate level as well. So my question is, is there available a full ride scholarship in your university for undergraduate student like either computer science or maybe in uh, mechanical engineering that in that areas? Okay, thank you. Actually, airspace and mechanical engineering is one of the finest department here in my university. And also the computer science is very top. So even the latest design of USA fighter plane few days before, I don't remember exactly the model. There was a debate on the USA came up with the latest aircraft, the design, the that project uh, actually the 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 team manager uh, he was the cal poly graduate so he uh, the dean of the college of engineering from my university he visited the inauguration program and he shared the picture of that student because that student he is leading that project he's actually from graduated from cal poly so they are kind of a teacher student right so they shared a picture and i also posted in my facebook profile so that news few days before if you check. So for undergraduate level, actually this admission is very competitive. The best student in the USA in California, they are coming here to study. And mostly even they born here, they're citizen, but still they're paying a high amount of tuition fees. So getting scholarship, definitely there are, but it will be really kind of uh, challenging unless your the applicant has or show outstanding ability for example you know the math olympiad physics olympiad the international company competitions for programming so that kind of achievement if you have in your profile that you competed and you rank nationally or maybe internationally you uh, achieve such kind of award or you own a certain kind of prize so only this exceptional quality student, like my cousin, currently he is uh, uh, just got a, a GPA five uh, from a rural school, like the from same school I studied in my high school, and then he studied uh, his HSC from uh, Erasrahi. It's not a renowned college even. But he was very much dedicated and he was following me like from my family, how I achieved this. He's kind of following me as a role model. So from that, actually he uh, developed his own skill at certain level. Even he competed physics Olympiad, nationally he ranked for the Rashtra division. And then this is how he was focused. And then without even coaching, he even his intermediate result was not a golden A plus. We are uh, like uh, quite shocked to see that. How come you are thinking about going abroad for undergrad, that kind of scholarship, and you did not get a scholarship? We criticized him, but he was so much dedicated. He showed his best, and without coaching, uh, he just gave admission to medical. He got in the first chance. 
he got a uh, uh, like chance in Maimanshing Medical College. Uh, then the second year, he said, no, no, I won't study medical. Then he get admission in IBA this last year. He admitted there and he said, no, I'll not study in here. I'm not interested to study undergrad here. And this year, he take admission. He took admission in Cambridge. Can you imagine? And he, uh, he get a uh, SAT score out of 1200, he get 1160 a super kind of high score. And then he faced interview recently, his result will be published this January. I'm also surprised. Definitely I'm not that much talented guy at his level. I'm really surprised. So if somebody can show his dedication and can show something with outstanding achievement, then definitely everywhere he can go. You can see without having a plus, golden A plus in HSC, a student who get medical uh, uh, admission, who get IBA admission, and now he is competing in Cambridge University for an undergrad scholarship. Just think about the spirit level. So, and he get a score is exceptionally high in SAT test. I'm hoping that he will be, he'll get that admission in, uh, in, in uh, Cambridge because he, he selected in the written test, only three students selected this year from Bangladesh. And he was one of them. So the story I'm sharing because only if you have that kind of quality, you are really, you may not have a good record in your national level of like the SSC, SSC or whatever the education system at 10th or 12th class. But still, if you are really qualified with other outside attributes, then definitely you can. So you can, you, you can get a, a full scholarship. But Chances are very few because undergrad level is totally kind of, uh, that student will not help in research, right? For postgraduate PhD, we, we work in lab and that is how they pay us, right? We kind of, a, we do a job and that is how university get publication, professors fulfill the project, complete the project and we do the man, uh, like as a human resource, we do the, uh, the hands work or, Physically, we, we support them in the lab. So this is how we get paid or if we do a TA ship, uh, RA ship like that. But undergrad student is totally paid uh, those funding. The university get nothing out of, I mean, that kind of stuff. That's why the scholarships are limited and only exceptionally uh, talented students are offered. So in my university, definitely you can. Still, you can apply. There are some scholarship available, but you must show kind of that kind of extraordinary skill or kind of achievement then only. So you Thank mean you. that there is a, uh, you know, is, uh, some offer. There are some offers in uni university, full ride offers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have experience, Dr. Hasnath. I have experience already. My son mm -hmm. is already in full ride scholarship in the USA, uh, okay. having his computer science degree. And by this time he got his place in Amazon and okay. uh, he is in our third year, in the middle of third year and he has got his place in Amazon and he, he, he was, uh, he is posted already in uh, internship. I'm talking about internship and he is posted already in your area like in, in uh, uh, Silicon Valley, okay, mm -hmm. Amazon uh, Research and Development Center there in main office and he got his internship there already. And he right. is, so I have experienced that one, as you say, and my daughter also uh, no way less than him uh, as well. In wow, in, in, <laughs> great! Yeah. And, a proud and my my daughter has kangaroo, you know, uh, kangaroo math competition because actually as a foreigner in Malaysia, uh, our children cannot take part in any kind of international competition like you know Olympiad because the Olympiad Malaysian national only be prepared to participate but oh, if my son and daughter want to participate they have to go back to our country and then they have to participate from there so uh, they had not such chance but for my son uh, what happened to him he was the uh, top scorer in mathematics in her uh, in his a level okay cambridge a level yeah or, that's what i said something need yeah. to be so something you know very 
special we need that one i understand i think my daughter also has some special uh, something like that but still i am wondering it's very competitive and full ride scholarship is more competitive actually uh, so why i am asking whether it is available in your university or not and if it is yes yes you can just uh, visit our site and everything is there yeah uh, thank you thank you uh, just for everything for joining with us maybe i will contact you because my son is coming may going to you know uh, start his internship in that amazon so which university your your son he is, is studying in, under in wabash college actually not in uh, wabash college you know liberal art college that one in indiana okay okay oh yeah you know yeah. my uh, first postdoc we had a plan to go indiana and the same city to start yeah. with my research project but somehow it did not work with that industry and finally they sent me to california <laughs> that's yeah. why i know that city name yeah yeah indiana he is doing good he is getting four out of four and from his college he is the uh, one last in last few years so he will uh, be in california place. so uh, yeah he can even meet me i'm here near yeah yeah so why yeah i am waiting till long to talk to you regarding that so that okay, i we can, can take that opportunity to contact you later and yeah. uh, my son may be sure. if you are kind enough he will be you know contacting you as yeah, well i'll be happy to meet him yeah yeah thank you very much uh, i am not taking uh, some more time from you it's already uh, you have given lot of time as you, uh, you you know you are having very busy schedule i know that one thank you uh, mr moderator thank you and thank i you. like also the bangladesh uh, mr alamgir the president of this association for organizing this kind of event and for uh, creating a very good platform to contribute to our community thank you very much thank, thank you, you very, thank you very much associate professor dr anamula kaji thank you very much sir so now we are going for the photo session could you open your camera we can take some photo Please, everyone, could you open your camera? We want to go for a photo session. Always smile. Please open uh, open camera if possible, all of you. Our technical team is gonna take a photo. Okay, done. Well, I think not yet. Just wait a bit. There are three pages. Okay, okay. You can take carefully. Oh, just the page. Please open your camera if possible because we know it's it's a night time, but. I think we almost finished, but before leaving, can can we smile all for one more photo? Can we smile all, if possible? Okay, thank you very much. Once again. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bacha, on behalf of BSM Organization Committee. Once again, I would like to thank you to all actively participating in this webinar. And also thank you very much all of the participants. We are looking forward to meet you all again at our future events. I apologize for any flaws and technical issues. With that, I am Amazon Mapu singing of this wishing. All the best, take care and stay safe. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Okay, but thank you very much. Dr. Mahfuz. Dr. Mahfuz. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I would be doctor. I would be doctor. Inshallah, inshallah. You're very soon. Doctor. You are, you are a doctor. Doctor, Thank you. Thank there. you very much, Bacha sir, for your time and for your okay, next Okay, I'm leaving. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye, sir. Thank you very much once again for joining, especially Bacha sir. And we're really happy to, uh, I mean, delighted and happy to have you on our platform.